you uh, undercover or something? No, I'm on the paid. What about the check? Would you take one? Welcome to episode 18 of the Columbo podcast, where we would love to be underpaid. That would be amazing. Imagine. It'd make a change. Underpaid. Oh, I aspire to be underpaid. We're going in the right direction. <laughs> yes. Nice episode this weekend. What's your thoughts? I thought it was a really interesting episode. I, um, I did. Well, I looked at the air date, obviously, and I realised it was the episode that was broadcast closest to the 10th anniversary of the JFK assassination. Mm. And it's a political episode, so I wondered if there was a deliberate tie in there. Seems like there a possibility anyway. I'm sure they would be aware of the significance at the very least. Yeah, I mean, this aired on the 4th, I think, of November, the assassination of the 22nd. But after this episode, there was a six-week hiatus. So this would have been the closest one. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned, I think, this was in the midst of the Watergate yeah, scandal. well, the Watergate break-in, I believe, had happened in the summer of 72. And mm -hmm. this was being recorded in the summer of 73 and broadcast mm -hmm. in the winter of 73 when it was really heating up, mm -hmm. leading to Nixon's resignation in 74. So a lot of political intrigue. It's probably a very aware society politically yes. at that time. So I think it maybe would have been an episode that caught the imagination. It's a, a longer episode this weekend, so... Longer even than last week's one, yeah. Yeah, I really like this episode. I enjoy it. It's not a top-tier episode for a couple of reasons. One, I think, is the length. There were some padded parts. Yeah, I, I think there was. And that prevents it, I think, for me just being a an A-plus episode. Yeah, it's still very good when I, I really enjoyed it. So did I, Ian. So uh, let's crack on, and you can give us this week's summary. Candidate for crime sees Columbo pitted against an experienced political campaigner, Nelson Hayward, as a case of mistaken identity unravels in the run-up to election day. Hayward kills his campaign manager, Harry Stone, in a desperate attempt to escape from a controlling, overbearing, unsackable man, but tries to stage the shooting to look like an attempt on Hayward's own life. This story is believed by many, but not Columbo, and the lieutenant is left to piece together clues that undermine Hayward's ongoing charade. A very polished summary there, Ian. Much like the lead character this week. Certainly a, a polished gentleman. We begin with an LA nightscape. Reminded me of the A-Team a little bit. Right. And we have the early credits again this week. It's almost not worth mentioning the early credits anymore because it's, trying to give, it's been you're standard. Trying to drop a, you're dropping a hint for me to stop <laughs> talking about it. Okay. We go immediately to the LAPDHQ. Yeah, we actually see Columbo in the opening scene. This mm -hmm. might be, is this the first time this has happened? The opening scene, I think, but not the first time he's been seen before, obviously, the, the crime has been committed. Sure, but this is very early mm -hmm. for Columbo to show up. And we see a, a man who we come to know as Nelson Hayward. He's in a, a media scrum. And we learn in this first scene that he has reluctantly accepted police protection due to apparent threats from organised crime. He's running for Senator of California. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't clear to me whether he was running for re-election or if he was trying to unseat mm -hmm. the incumbent or if it was uh, two new candidates. It wasn't entirely clear, I don't think. I think my understanding would be that he is running for the first time. Okay. But yeah, you're right, it wasn't specifically uh, mentioned. And he's playing this politician very well. He, he is very polished, he knows how to work the cameras and, and the media, and he knows to, how to give them what they're, what they're looking for. Definitely. And the news report itself, it confirms that he will have 24-hour protection in the lead-up to this, uh, the Senate election. Yep, and... There's a really nice segue, like a move from the TV, well, from the scene to the TV report being watched in a different room. Yeah, it's being watched in a sort of campaign off a uh, hotel suite. Yeah, and we see the campaign manager. And he's a Harry Stone, so he's watching this news broadcast with uh, Linda Johnson, and we discover that she is Nelson's or Hayward's wife's secretary. And is having an affair with him 
at his beach house. We right. learn that quite quickly. Yeah, it's laid out in this, these early exchanges. The manager Harry, campaign manager Harry, he's certainly not happy with with Linda. No, he obviously thinks that the campaign could be torpedoed if mm. news of this leak. I'm not sure how much it was frowned on to have a mistress. I know that there's certainly rumours about certain presidents mm. having <laughs> numerous ones, but I suppose the confirmation of one might be different than the suspicion or the belief yes. that they existed. And she claims she doesn't understand that it doesn't matter what the relationship's like because she claims that he's not in a happy, happy marriage. Harry Stone doesn't care if it's happy or not, it's the, the perception. Well, yeah, there's the whole, the political marriage is a, a different animal altogether, isn't it? Mm. Linda's not prepared to take it from Harry, though. She wants Nelson to break things off with her directly. And Harry reminds her that Nelson does what Harry tells him to do. Yes, and that's going to prove to be a, a key point in the early part of this episode. We then see Hayward arriving at the underground parking facility of this hotel and he's followed by his protection detail. Yeah, we've got this establishing moment here with the, the security is present, they're with mm -hmm. him at all times. So some of this security detail remain with the car downstairs and another one follows him in the elevator up to outside the suite door. Yeah. Harry congratulates Nelson on the publicity that he is gained and garnered through this this um, this mafia threat. Yeah, whether it might perhaps be an imagined threat or a um, created threat. I think it, has, it is confirmed that it's a, a PR ruse. Yeah, there's a good moment here when they refer to his next speech. Um, the speech writers refer to as Gillis, which I mm -hmm. can only imagine is a nod to Jackson Gillis, who's a long-time writer on the Columbo show. Well spotted, Dean. <laughs> so Nel Nelson enters the bedroom. And we see him place a gun with a silencer and a watch into a briefcase. Yeah, he looks generally quite dodgy at mm -hmm. this point. In fact, he puts on a evil doer's face as he goes into the room. It's actually quite funny, and I think it's deliberate. Mm -hmm. Any time he is in this episode, he's alone. His he drops the charade, the mask. You know, the the public face mm. slips away as soon as he is on his own. Every time he leaves the bedroom and. We hear Harry basically telling him in precise sort of detail what he should be saying and doing. So he's controlling everything yeah. that he does. And there's a particular pain point when it comes to Linda. Mm -hmm. Because Nelson doesn't want to end his relationship with Linda. No. He quite enjoys it. He, But Harry insists. He says, I'm managing this campaign. You'll do what you're told. Yeah, he is very focused on his job, which is to get Nelson elected. And... Nelson tells him that, yes, he is running the campaign, but he can't run his private life. And we have a clip here of the response. Whose lipstick is this? Linda's. I asked her over. Guess why? To tell her to get out of my life. You guessed. Harry, stay out of my private life. You don't have any private I'm life. I'm telling you. No, no I'm, I'm telling you. Summer. I put too much into getting you where you are now to take a chance on blowing it. Now, whatever affects your political life affects me. Linda Johnson's a political liability. Harry, I need her. You don't need anybody but me. You can get rid of anybody but me because I know where the bodies are buried, Nels. I buried them for you. Now, that's why I'm calling this shot. She's out. Not just until after the election. You're going to be a happily married senator. Linda's out, period. So Nelson is initially receptive, or at least on the surface receptive, to the suggestion that he cool things with Linda. Yeah, he does. He appears to accept this. So what he wants to do is he pretends to call Linda. Yeah, he immediately hangs up the phone. Yeah, Under the guise of arranging a meeting. Now, Harry wants him to tell her over the phone, but Nelson tells Harry that if, she, if he does this over the phone, not face-to-face, there is a chance and a risk that Linda may do or say something that would damage the campaign. So he asks Harry... Yeah, he's, he's using Harry's fears against him, essentially. And we understand that Nelson must have anticipated this entire conversation because all the planning that he's done relies on Harry making this demand at this time. So it proceeds from that basis. They are going to find a way to get out of the hotel room so that Nelson can meet with Linda and cut ties, mm. essentially. The first thing that they have to do is lose the detail at the door, the hotel door. Yeah, it's a much easier job than you might imagine. Mm. 
he asks him to go and buy him some uh, cigars, which he he does. Yeah, he's a very obliging fellow. He mm. seems to confuse being a security detail with being a personal assistant. A butler. Yeah. So on losing him, the two of them, uh, they go downstairs to the parking lot. Yeah, they're going to use separate cars so that Harry can pretend to be Nelson, lead a merry chase off in mm. one direction, and Nelson can go to meet Linda in the yeah, other direction. That's, that's their plan. And they've, they've swapped jackets. Yeah, it's just an unbreakable disguise. It's like Clark Kent's glasses. Yeah. As soon as he's got the camel hair on, he becomes yeah. Nelson. When they when they go downstairs to this parking lot, the cops are con- very conveniently standing together, uh, facing away from where they enter. And they do not hear these two men approach. Yes, yeah, it's, it's fortuitous. Very fortuitous. You might say it's a bit chancy what they're doing here. Mm-hmm. And Harry gets into Nelson's car, wearing his hat and his coat, and he's under instruction to drive to the beach house. Yeah, and he's going to get a taxi back. Mm -hmm. So he leaves with the cops following. Now, why was there only one cop upstairs outside the suite door, but there was three watching the car? Perhaps they felt the security should be at the earliest point of contact and mm. if anyone tried to get in they would intercept them far sooner. Yeah, possibly. Or perhaps it was a convenient plot point mm. for the, the writers. This did annoy me a little bit. This whole thing relied on when, when they, um, well, it relies on two things, this plot. When they both arrived in the parking lot that they would not immediately be noticed and seen by the three cops who were down there. Yeah. That, as you see, that was very convenient. And the th- second thing is that for this to work, you have to be sure that Harry is able to lose the the tail from the cops. And I don't really think you can rely upon that, can you? It certainly is chancy, I would say. I'm going to keep using that word because it comes up later on. But they're, they're taking a gamble here. They're hoping, essentially that Harry is going to be more skilled at... Unless, unbeknown to us, Harry has done this before, has lost a tail. Maybe. For Nelson, maybe when they've been driving together or something. Mm-hmm. Maybe he's known to be able to do that. So, when Harry arrives at the beach house, Nelson is waiting for him. Harry parks the car in the garage and the lights are off. Yeah. And he's initially sort of pleased to see his friend there. Because mm-hmm. I think Harry genuinely thinks he's doing the right thing. I think he, he doesn't realise that he's an antagonist to mm-hmm. Nelson. And he seems relatively surprised, but pleasantly surprised, but not for long. No, he shoots him dead. Yes, very dead. And again, this is a little issue. How, at this point, Nelson could not have known that the cops were not moments away tailing. Yeah, or a taxi hadn't been called in advance mm. or anything like that. Very risky. Very chancy. Yeah. And also, my feeling is that the motive was weak. Mm. I mean, I appreciate that um, Harry had secrets and he had knowledge but I would have thought in the political world he would have been better served getting another job on the basis of his work rather than spilling those secrets and then making himself unemployable in politics Mm -hmm. so I would have thought that Nelson might have been better off just firing him than um, firing a gun at him So Nelson removes a watch the watch we've seen he placed in the briefcase Yeah, he puts this on Harry's wrist and removes Harry's own watch Yes. And he smashes this new one in order to establish the apparent time of death. Yeah, if, well, he winds it onto the time he has selected mm-hmm. uh, to represent the time of death, and then, yes, he smashes it up. And, and another thing, where did Nelson get this watch from? That was his own drawer, mm, wasn't it? Well, yeah. it was his own drawer in a hotel, so perhaps he purchased it for the purpose. Mm. That's, yeah, okay, but someone, someone may have recognised that watch. Well, unless it's one that he's never worn, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Or a common one, maybe. We then return to Nelson Hayward's home. And we see him creep in via the back the back garden. And he speaks to someone who's standing in, in the garden. In the garden. Is that bushes. security? No. When I w- re-watched this again, I couldn't remember who that was. But yeah, that's the some of the, the party guests. Who right, so he's lining them up. He's yeah. saying, get ready for this. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we see a woman inside, and she's clearly enjoying a drink. Yeah. And she, as she gets a refill in the dark, we then see Nelson approach her from behind. And I think there's meant to be an assumption 
that he is about to commit a second murder yeah, by strangulation. Yeah, it's all very sinister. Instead, we find out it's a surprise party. Yes. And there are a lot of guests there who appear all from... All friends, yeah. Yeah, appear from nowhere or, or the garden. And we discover this woman as his wife, Vicky, as he recounts the subdiffuse with Harry in order to get home without... Um, yeah. For this private party. Yeah, the same ruse that he and Harry have pulled off has been for three different reasons already. Mm-hmm. Uh, he tells it the way he tells it to his wife. It was so that he could attend the party, mm-hmm. which seems a relatively sensible way to present it. I would imagine, but she, I don't think is. I mean, I think she's pleasantly surprised at the party, but I don't think that she's overly fond of Nelson generally. No, I think she knows what he is like, and that. Whatever he is doing here, it's not for her benefit. Yeah. At the very least, it's to make him look like the adoring, loyal husband. It's for sure rather mm-hmm. than a, a sign of love, I would imagine. It's how she sees it. Yeah. So they're mingling for a for a while, and then Nelson looks at the clock and yep, excuses he's keeping himself. An time, yes. yeah. And he makes an anonymous phone call to the police, pretending yep. to be the killer. He cleverly disguises his voice by putting a small, thin handkerchief over the... Very much in the the way that we saw in the greenhouse jungle mm-hmm. uh, when Jarvis, Jarvis did the same thing, yeah. but so, still sounded exactly like Ray Milland. Sure, but the camera wasn't on the other end of the phone line. So, <laughs> so he informs that the police where the remains of Nelson Hayward essentially apartment. calls in his own killing. Mm-hmm. We then go to the dentist. Yes, Columbus at the dentist. Yeah, it's the introduction. Well, the, you know, the, the first proper introdu- introduction in this episode to Columbo. Yeah, and. This is a night, it's a funny-ish scene, but it's one of the scenes that you could lose. It's a bit of padding, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's a big talk about how, you know, Italians stick together, all this stuff about Italians, mafia, stereotypes. Mm -hmm. This is the second week in a row we've had this talk about Colombo's Italian heritage. heritage. There wasn't really much of it in the first two seasons. No. So it makes you wonder, is it deliberate? Is there a reason for this? Or is it just happened to come up two weeks in a row? Mm -hmm. Is it a particular writer or a pair of writers who, like focus on that particular aspect of Columbo's mm-hmm. personality, I don't know. But it's interesting that it's come up twice in a row. Columbo is having work done and he's gagging. <laughs> he's not happy. <laughs> uh, there's opera music playing as the dentist, You know, as you rightly say, the dentist is dismayed about the pr- portrayal of Italians in the, in the media, isn't he? Yeah. And then the news report comes over the radio and Columbo apparently hears that Nelson... Hayward has been killed after eluding protection. He's quite agitated. Obviously, we saw him right at the start of the episode around Hayward. Mm-hmm. So he's obviously got an interest. We move then to the beach house again. And Columbo arrives at the, cre- the crime scene. A crowd has gathered. And Columbo appears to be quite upset at the death. Yeah, well, first of all, we hear police radio chatter mm-hmm. talking about it, which did remind me a bit of the JFK documentaries that you see. Yeah, where you hear the the police audio from the day, it was very reminiscent of that for me. Sure. And then Columbo shows up; he gets chastised by the commissioner for his lateness immediately. Mm. He notices that the street light has been broken, and he mentions that that's the type of thing he did as a, a kid to no one in particular. No, but that reminded me of Death Lends a Hand when he talked about how he used to stick potatoes up uh, exhaust pipe. Yes, tailpipe. he was clearly a rowdy child. Well, obviously. Columbo's delighted, and it's a bit of a, a wife trope here, to discover that it was Harry Stone that was killed and not Nelson Hayward. Yeah, it's almost a bit of a macabre delight mm-hmm. here. You know, someone else is dead. Mm-hmm. The guy's been murdered, but Columbo's delighted it's not a guy that he didn't want to be murdered. Yeah, and they'll be extra delighted because uh, Nelson Hayward is clearly a more handsome man than Harry Stone in the middle of it. <laughs> Columbo doesn't like... <laughs> he doesn't like the beautiful to die young. No. <laughs> So it's clearly a case of mistaken identity we're led to believe. Yeah. And did you mention, yeah, he's chastised by the the commissioner for being late? Yes. Yeah. I think there are a couple of points in this scene where uh, they they seem a bit dismayed and a bit disrespectful to Columbo, who is obviously a super cop with a a tremendous record of cleaning up crimes. He's becoming a legend in the department, Mm -hmm. we're led to believe, a year ago. So... You can only imagine it's it's maybe it's all those not guilty from season two <laughs> that have led him to be held in lower esteem, but certainly he's working. He's you know sniffing around. He's finding out about the time of death and the sequence of events. Yeah, he finds out apparently it happened at twenty past nine according to the the watch on his wrist. Yeah. 
but he's a little surprised that it's only 10pm at the moment and he's been checking the uh, the car. He puts his hand on the mm-hmm. bonnet or the hood to see what the temperature is. Mm-hmm. Columbo speaks to Miller. He's the first cop on the scene. And he confirms to Columbo that the garage light was off when he arrived. And this appears to puzzle Columbo. Well, because Columbo's just clocked the street light broken. So yeah. he's, he's immediately thinking, well, how did the see? Mm-hmm. And then we have a very strange scene. Columbo stops the body as it's been driven away and he jumps into the back of the, the ambulance. He had to check something. He's right in there, isn't he? With the yeah. body. There's something he wants to see. Mm-hmm. And it's quite interesting because we've seen and we actually discussed previous episodes where he didn't see the body. It was mm-hmm. removed without him seeing it and didn't seem to be an issue. Yeah. But this time, yeah, he... He wants to see this one. He does. So the commissioner tells Columbo that if it had been Nelson Hayward who had been murdered, he would personally head up the investigation. But as it's just Harry Stone... He's not going to bother. He's not going to bother and it's Columbo's... Uh, it's Columbo's yeah, responsibility. He's got lunches to take and, you know, people mm-hmm. to shake hands with. And then Columbo is told that they have just now located Nelson Hayward at his home. Previously, the maid had insisted that he was not there until that point, but it's confirmed that he's having a party and Columbo is, to be, is tasked with breaking the bad news. Yeah, he, he heads over that direction. Mm-hmm. So he arrives at this party and is offered cake... Well, it's By not, Vicky. Well, Vicky's clearly drunk, but she mm. just wants rid of him. She's saying, you know, there's nothing we can talk to you about here. Go in the back, have a bit of cake. You know, it's an entirely mm-hmm. inappropriate thing to say, but I think she is, it's a combination of being drunk and also not wanting to see him. She's fed up with cops and everything else yeah. surrounding and, and interfering with her life. Yes. I think. Columbo insists that he needs to speak to Nelson and um, and he's brought inside. And Nelson jokes that he may be in trouble for... Um, Dodging his yeah, yeah. patrol. Yeah. But uh, Columbo advises him that, no, in fact, it's an important matter. And after a bit of persuasion, gets him to come off to one side and tells him that Harry's dead. And he feigns shock at this news as the party disperses. It abruptly ends, mm-hmm. is what I noted. It's a very sudden um, dispersal of people. Yes, and Nelson insists that Harry was a, a close personal friend. But we see that Vicky overhears this and isn't convinced by by this act. Sure, she knows the truth. But in any event, Nelson won't answer any questions. Yeah, so yeah he says I want, he wants to be left alone. The guests do confirm, however, that the party started around half past eight. Mm-hmm. That evening, we're in Nelson's study, I think it is. Okay. And we see Vicky drinking as yeah. <laughs> again as Nelson arrives in his, uh, his house coat. And she clearly doesn't buy this sort of grief that he has for, for Harry. She acknowledges his tendency to spend nights away uh, from from her home. I think we actually have a clip here. Oh, don't tell me. A little thing like Harry's getting murdered is enough to make you sleep at home tonight. No, I forgot. Please guard outside. Can't step out tonight, can you? Vicky, let's don't go at each other again. Not tonight. Come on. No. Come on. Let's not. <laughs> Out of respect for poor dead Harry, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Besides, I wouldn't want to see you dissemble before my very eyes again. Your display of grief is overpowering. Well, in spite of everything, the man had been with me for a very long time. Yeah. Ultimately, Nelson wins her round with a promise of a campaigning trip together ahead of the election. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because what he says is that this is all part of the game. He maybe didn't have uh, that 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 um, that sort of love for Harry that he's trying to pretend he does, but that's how people would expect him to act. Yeah, it's, it's a political manoeuvre mm-hmm. almost. It's a public show. It's a the public face that we've talked about yeah. already. And he insists that, that there is no other woman in his life. Yep. He's got, but, he's but clearly, please bring Linda on, on campaign with That us. was so cheeky, wasn't it? Yeah. That was incredible. We'll mention just now the actress who played uh, his wife, Vicky. Okay. So she was played by Joanne Linville. She was born in 1928, and she was generally a, a character actress who was in 
TV shows such as Kojak, Hawaii Five O, <clears throat> Mrs. Columbo, oh dear. I Spy with, with Robert Culp. Robert Culp. And we have the familiar connection here. She was in the the original Star Trek series and she played the first ever female Romulan. Oh, Is there that you go. Close Cousins of the Vulcans? Really? Yes. Okay, there you go. The next morning we're at the campaign headquarters. Yep, campaign HQ where mm-hmm. all the glad handing gets done. Mm-hmm. We see Columbo reading the LA Chronicle as Nelson, his wife and Linda arrive to some great applause. Yeah, and Nelson's shaking everybody's hand, thanking them for their hard work. I would imagine these would mostly be volunteers. Yeah. Interns, because we hear later from Linda that she was originally mm-hmm. an intern until she was uh, promoted. And Nelson asks Linda to go into his private office to pick up an itinerary. But sure. she, she she moves through there. Columbo hears him say that, yeah. which is important. Then there's a, a funny a funny scene. Nelson asks Columbo about who he'll be voting for. Right. Can you remember this? I don't think Columbo's keen to commit. He's not. He said that he doesn't have to worry about his wife. She'll certainly be voting for, for him. Yeah. But he's sort of on the fence at the moment. <laughs> Which is, I thought that was nice. You'd expect him to perhaps just let him hear just what see. he wanted to hear. Yeah, yeah. Nelson then goes into the office and him and Linda kiss. Columbo's outside just milling around and he's humming this old man. We hear that for the first time in this episode. Yeah, second time in the show. A delivery man arrives. He's a camel jacket for uh, Nelson, yeah. which yeah. came from the, the tailors. It's a bespoke jacket. That's right. And it's signed for and received by a secretary. Did you recognise the secretary? I did not recognise the secretary. Okay, so the secretary was the daughter of the director, Boris Segal, who we've previously mentioned. Yes, she went on to have a, a career, did she not? Yes, Peggy Bundy in Married with Children, and she was most recently in Sons of Anarchy. There you go. What happens next to you? Well, Columbo spots Linda leaving the office and joins Nelson to have a conversation. Mm-hmm. And it's an elongated conversation, you might say. We, we begin with Columbo explaining to Nelson that officially, officially, the department has nothing, mm-hmm. and officially Columbo has nothing, but unofficially, just him personally, Unofficially, even though he is the police officer leading the investigation, unofficially, he has some ideas and some things are bothering him. Yeah, so he he wants to explain what's bothering him by showing or writing on on a poster. Yeah, he uses the back of one of the big uh, vote Hayward. He's his own man. Yeah, campaign posters. And I'm not sure if that's a borrowed slogan or not, but certainly it's a no. uh, catchy one. Yeah. He asks if he can use this poster on it because he said he doesn't like waste. And then yeah. he mentions his brother who is 38. He's got the same school, shoes he went to school. Yeah. Nelson starts to get frustrated at this. That's, you know, faffing around. Yeah. And Columbo not getting to the point. And Columbo then says that it, that trait also gets on his wife's nerves. Yeah. Before we leave the topic of the or going back to the topic of his slogan, mm-hmm. uh, Nelson Hayward, he's his own man, ironically, would have probably been crafted by Harry, who mm. is entirely controlling him and stopping him from being his own man. Yes. Nice observation, Ian. <laughs> so Columbo explains uh, the issue. Yeah, he's got this concern with the lighting, because he spotted the smashed streetlight, and he gets talks to Nelson about how they would both have done that as children. Mm-hmm. And so what does his problem mean? Can you describe yeah, the, the issue? he draws he a diagram, and he shows that the spot in the garage where Harry was killed couldn't have been lit from outside because the street lamp was out. Mm-hmm. It couldn't have been lit easily by a car because a car lighting that would have to park across the road and that is chancy. Mm. And Columbus doesn't think any killer would do anything chancy, obviously. Mm-hmm. And in any event, it didn't make sense. Nelson tries to explain it, as the killers do. In this case, he's very eager to offer an explanation He's almost agitated with this, isn't he? He jumps up and he... he, he yeah, he, he's he, keen to show that the narrative in his head is plausible. Mm. So he's almost justifying his own theory. He offers a solution, but Columbo dismisses that due to the angle of the yeah. the, the shooting, well, etc. I thought Columbo was a bit... 
See, what Nelson says they could have done is they could have pulled up their car offset with the other one mm-hmm. so that one headlight was shining into the corner. And Columbo says to do that would be like catching lightning in a bottle. No. Uh, it seems to me a lot less challenging to park a car slightly askew from another one than yeah. to catch lightning in a bottle. <laughs> yeah, this um, this issue is something that bothers me as well. There's so many plausible explanations to this that I, I don't know why it's bugging Columbo that much. For example, this is apparently is a professional mafia style hitman. Yeah. Maybe maybe he brought a, a torch with him. Maybe he brought another person with him. Exactly, good point. There may have been more than one person. But then Columbo gets the response that he's looking for, I think, and this sets him off. I think at this point now he thinks, well, he would certainly have something to hide. Whether mm. he's the killer or not, he's, it's too soon to say, but he's, he's hiding something and Columbo wants to know what it is. Nelson seems to gather himself. Well, he, he offers another solution. He says, yeah. what if the killer was waiting uh, for him when he arrived, rather than yeah. following him from the the suite? That's what I was going to say. Kenny mm. gathers himself, and I'm thinking, right, he's just going to stonewall him and say, well, how would I know, or show a mm-hmm. regular amount of interest. But yeah. no, he goes off with another explanation. But Columbo rules that out, because how would a killer know that Harry was going to be there? Mm-hmm. Why would he be waiting at the beach? Or, or even know that Nelson was going to be there? Yeah. Why would he be waiting at the beach? What reason would he have to think that? And also, the killer would not have known that Harry had lost his security detail if he hadn't followed him. Yeah. So many reasons why mm-hmm. that's not plausible. So because of this, Columbo suggests that maybe it was not mistaken identity. And this is a real big slip from, from Nelson here. Because he's, well, Columbo's eyes anyway. Yeah, he is outraged by the this suggestion. And he says that, you know, someone has been wearing his clothes, driving his car, parking in his beach house. It must have been him that was the intended victim. Well, we'll hear a, we'll hear a clip just now and then I'll, I'll come back on this point. Well, well now, what, uh, what do you make of all this, Lieutenant? Nothing conclusive, sir. But maybe the prevailing theory is wrong. Maybe this is not a case of mistaken identity. Maybe the murderer actually wanted to kill What are you Stoker. talking about? That is absurd. Repeated threats are made of my life, and a man wearing my jacket and my hat, driving my car, pulls into my garage, and he's shot down dead. And you say that's not a case of mistaken identity. I don't believe that. I just don't believe it. I thought you'd be relieved. But I... I mean... I mean... I thought you'd be happy to know that the murderer wasn't trying to shoot you. Well, Lieutenant, it's, it's not a case of relief. It's a... Uh, it's a... It's a case of just trying to intelligently appraise exactly what happened. Absolutely. Absolutely, sir. I have to admit, if it was me, i feel relieved. I think that Columbo's wrong to assume that Nelson should be relieved, because if I'm Nelson, I'm concerned about my own well-being. I don't just accept that it's not me that's being targeted. Mm -hmm. Although I know there's not a plot, you know, Mm -hmm. for the sake of this fiction. Assuming there's a mafia plot against him mm-hmm. that, that's a genuine threat. The fact that the police are saying, oh no, they weren't trying to kill you, that would concern me. Mm. What Does that mean that maybe they're not putting in all mm-hmm. their effort into protecting me anymore? Mm. Um, I think that would be the, or a possible reaction. It would be, and I don't think relief would be an automatic response. So I think Colombo is reaching a little bit here. But certainly, because he's on the right track anyway, it doesn't matter that much in this investigation. Sure. We then get the first of around three one more thing yeah. scenarios. First one more thing. You notice that Linda did not retrieve the itinerary that she came in for. Mm-hmm. Nelson claims that you know these campaigns cause lots of, lots of stress and pressure and she must have forgotten. Yeah. Columbo leaves, comes back in. What's the second one more thing? Yeah, the one more one more thing is that the temperature of the car engine casts some degree of doubt on the time of the killing Mm -hmm. because it had time to cool down by the point that the police arrived yeah which suggests that the killing may well or probably must have happened earlier than the time of the watch suggested nelson does not try and provide an explanation for this but he he looks worried he seems inconsistent a little bit he's kind of fraying at the edges i think he is concerned Mm -hmm. We then have the third, one more thing. One more, one more, one more thing. Columbo wants put on the security detail and he's going to be around. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then another one more thing. Yeah. So he asks how much he paid for his uh, his jacket. Yes. Which and is this a, is a, a nice wee exchange because he mm. says two hundred dollars and Clem says not including the pants. <laughs> he can't conceive that the jacket itself would have been two hundred dollars. But anyway, colombo has got a tip there. He's off to speak to the tailor. Yeah. Who, Produce the jacket. Well, just before that, there's a, a, a comic exchange when Nelson asks him if he's ever thought about uh, getting a change of wardrobe. And Columbo says he, he has thought about it. He thought about perhaps getting a new a new coat. Yeah, but that one's got some wear left in it, he thinks. Yeah. Nelson says yes. It is very functional. <laughs> comp. Certainly, yeah. So we're off to Chadwick's. And uh, Chadwick's is the tailor's. Yes, and we, we meet a familiar face. Yes. We meet... Vito Scotti, who plays Chadwick, and he was uh, he made an appearance last week as the snobbish uh, maitre d' in any old port in a, a yes, storm. in the restaurant that mm. served the heated port. Mm. He plays a, a similar uh, sort of character here. He is quite impatient and snobbish, as Colombo describes the type of coat he wants. <laughs> you go through what I, I noted as fifty shades of brown. <laughs> yeah, and he then Colombo explains that he wants this for an affair. Yes, and then the the response is, "Oh, splendid! An affair." <laughs> I don't think, I don't think they mean the same thing by affair. I don't think they mean an extramarital affair. No, no, I think no. he just means a do. Yes, and it's for his, the affair in question is his wife's bowling league dinner, which uh, is going to cost seventeen dollars fifty per couple, <laughs> which is obviously you know requires a, a new jacket. Yes, if they're going to such an expensive dinner, so he selects a material for the jacket. Similar to Nelson's, or the same well, as Nelson's. The same as Nelson's, yes. And then Chadwick is annoyed to discover that Colombo is asking for it to be completed within a, a few days. And he tells him that it would take at least 10 days to create this. Yes. And Colombo says, but Mr. Hayward said you could do it quicker. He had one delivered today. Mm-hmm. Chadwick tells him that it was ordered 10 days ago. Yes. It- it wasn't a rush job at all. Mm-hmm. It was done to the normal time scale. It's, it's information that I'm, I'm intrigued that he is happy to hand out at this point, but mm-hmm. certainly he does. Although ultimately, Nelson's going to have a good answer for this, so it seems a bit of a waste of time. Yeah. We go to a, a recreation centre. Yes, they're dedicating a community recreation centre. Mrs Hayward's there. Yep, she's opening the, the, the centre in front of a number of guests, and Linda is there, and she is serving cake. Colombo introduces himself to Linda... But she's very wary of him. She doesn't want to talk to him at all. Doesn't seem keen to answer any of his questions. Yeah. Colombo wants to know who organised the surprise birthday party the night before. Yes, because they're obviously going to be involved in the the conversation that preceded it. Mm -hmm. And Linda said that it was not her and doesn't understand why it's important. Yeah, Colombo tries to explain. Mm. What he says is that Harry was not aware of this. Yeah, it wasn't in his diary and he kept very detailed notes. Mm-hmm. Because he's a very efficient manager. Yeah. And then Linda admits that she didn't like Harry. And she admits also that Nelson hired her after she had volunteered during the primaries. Yes. And Columbo says that he understands why he she may have wanted to work for him because, this is a bit of a trope, he was a very attractive man. Yeah. It couldn't and possibly be his politics. No, no. He goes on to say that um, he thinks she's a wonderful girl and Mr. Hayward is very lucky to have someone like her supporting him. Oh, yeah. So that suggests that Columbo is maybe aware that mm-hmm. there's more than meets the eye to their relationship. Sure. Linda was played by Tisha Sterling, born in 1944. Again, a bit of a character actress. She was in The Young and the Restless. She was in Coogan's, uh, uh, Coogan's Bluff. And she made an appearance in Batman in three episodes, I think, playing the character called Legs. Oh, well, there you go. I thought that was Julian Newmar's role. I was going to say, <laughs> miscast there. <laughs> From here we go to... Well, there's three scenes that crop up here. The next you don't three like scenes, any of them? No, it's not, it's not that I don't like them, Ian. It's that I think these three scenes typify the padding of this episode. I think they could be removed in one line. Uh, and the entire episode could have been reduced to the sort of the sweet spot of the seventy-four, 74 minutes, minute yeah. mark. But we'll, we'll go through these um, th- three scenes first. Yeah, Columbo's looking for directions, but the the local police are doing check spot checks on cars, mm-hmm. and he's pulled over, and the car falls on 
or fails the test on a number of points. Yeah, one of them is that his right turn signal is out. Now, was that not out in Death Lends a Hand when he was stopped mm. at the beginning of the episode? Certainly something was. Can't remember yeah. if that was it or not. It could well have been. We'll double check that. Also, there was a, a nod or a reference to Requiem for a Falling Star. The cop asks him if he's ever thought about getting another car. And I think he uses uses the same it's line. almost word for word what he said to the security guard in that episode. Yeah. Which was? He has another car. His wife drives it, but it's not fancy. It's just for transportation. So from there we go to the beach house. Yeah, Columbo's now driving a different vehicle. It's a rescue truck, isn't it? Yeah, a tow truck. And he's timing himself. He's got a stopwatch and he stops at a jun- he, he leaves from the beach house and then we see him stop at a junction and we don't know why, but yeah. he's confused about something when he gets there. He stops his watch and then drives on. That's him. From there we go to the garage. And he is returning the truck to Shelley, the garage owner. Yeah, he uh, just borrowed it. Mm-hmm. He was repairing his car and had lent them this th- this truck to, yeah. to get there, around. There was obviously quite a lot of work required in the car because yeah. there's a hefty bill. Well, yeah, he tips him for... Firstly, he gives him a tip for, the, for lending him the truck. Yes. But I think he then wishes he hadn't when he receives that bill. $62.25. So Colombo doesn't have that the type of cash, the amount of cash on him no. to pay. Nor does he have his checkbook. No. So he has to produce... Oh, well, he does, have a, does he have a checkbook? No, there's a counter check. So I'm yes. not entirely sure how that system works. Yeah. Maybe somebody listening can explain the counter check system to mm-hmm. us. But I assume it's some kind of promissory note. I think you need an ID for that. And Colombo shows him his police ID because that's all he has on him. Yeah. And Shelley asks him if he is... Undercover. Yeah, we heard this at the, the top of the episode. Yeah. He says, no, no, he's underpaid. This whole scene um, is only here to let us know that the gas station was closed on the night of the murder. Yeah, Shelley comes back when Colombo points out he's a policeman or shows him that he's a policeman and says, are you, are you investigating the murder at the beach house? He mm-hmm. says, yes. He says, ah, oh, only a bit of excitement around here for ages and I missed it because uh, we ran out of gas and shot early that mm-hmm. night. What I mentioned earlier was that those three scenes could have been removed and summed up in one line later on. Yeah. Because remember, what he discovers is that he could not have stopped this gas uh, station to make the call. But we never, you know, there was no indication that he had made that call. When Colombo arrived at the junction after timing the, the journey... Yeah, you just said there's nowhere to make a call. There is nowhere, yeah. So we, we didn't need this, uh, or, or the, the previous two scenes. We go to... Nelson's house again and he's preparing to do a, a TV promo yeah they're going to do a campaign. TV spot him and his entourage are mm. all getting hyped up for yeah. getting themselves prepared Linda tells Nelson about Colombo speaking to her earlier and she's worried she doesn't you know, she doesn't understand what he's up to yeah. doesn't trust him she doesn't like the idea that he's like going around asking questions yeah. about reminded, yeah, reminded me of the situation last week yes where um, the uh, the secretary was protective, hmm. shall we say. Slightly different personal situation. This is one where there is an affair mm-hmm. as opposed to one where there's just a unrequited affection or at least unspoken affection. Nelson ass- reassures her, attempts to reassure her. Yeah, and just then we kind of see Colombo stumbling past and he's mm-hmm. up the stairs, the big box. Yeah, he arrives and he says he's got a, a few questions and Nelson insists that he will give, uh, he will answer these questions. We have a, a clip of this exchange. Oh, sir. Listen, a couple of things came up that I want to discuss with you, but I don't want to burden you now because I can see you got a lot on your mind. Well, well quite to the contrary. There's no time like the present. What can I do for you? Here, uh, why don't you gentlemen go on out and wait in the patio? I'll be right there. Oh, listen, I don't want to inconvenience you. Not at all. No, you got this TV thing on your mind. No, 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 no. Let's understand something, Lieutenant. You see, you think I'm reluctant to talk to you, but you're wrong. I will talk to you as often as you want, for as long as you want, about anything you want. Oh. Oh, fine. Well, uh, I'll tell you one of the things that's bothering me. Why don't we sit down, Sit down here. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you very much. I think it's quite clear that Hayward knows what's going on. It's game on at this point. And he's going to bring his skills to bear. It was a novel approach. Uh, most of the time they recoil or just try try to answer 
uh, the questions being, yeah. being put to him. But in this case, he's he's on the attack, isn't he? He's yeah, trying to he destabilise Colombo. He needs to be proactive. He's not going to get anywhere hoping that his story holds up. He needs to do more to shore it up himself. Mm-hmm. Colombo compliments Nelson on his uh, jacket and tells him that he went to his tailor. And Nelson makes a little joke about it being a challenge for for Chadwick. Because <laughs> it's brilliant. I think Colombo's response is brilliant. <laughs> he assumes it's because, or he indicates that his assumption is it's because he thinks Colombo's a funny shape yeah. and the jacket wouldn't fit right. <laughs> Who knows? I, I would have thought it's more a fashion point. Mm-hmm. Colombo, uh, Colombo had previously been offered a drink which he refused from Nelson. And Nelson again plays this, you know, Colombo as, at his own game. Colombo starting to ask his questions and get into the swing of his questioning and Nelson interrupts him, tells him he's going to get a drink anyway. Yeah, he always, yeah, he just undermines the, the line of question. Not undermines the line of questioning, but just takes the moment away from mm. Colombo. And then Colombo explains his issue about the jacket being ordered in advance. Yes, and Hayward explains that it had been ordered anyway because the one that mm. Harry was shot in was frayed at the call uh, yeah. cuffs that had a cigarette mm. burn on the sleeve and essentially renders the entire scene with the tailor pointless. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this again is it's nice, it's different. Colombo is not making much ground, it doesn't seem. Yeah, I know it's a good uh, exchange uh, sparring that we've talked about in the past. Yeah, I, I like it. I think this was one of the better parts of this episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I loved the performance by uh, by Jackie Cooper, who played Nelson Hayward. Jackie Cooper died in 2011, aged 81. He was a, a child superstar. Oscar nominated at the age of nine for his role in uh, Skippy. And that was a record for, which stood for over 50 years. He won two Emmys. He was also in The Champ, Hennessy, The People's Choice. Uh, most famously, from my perspective, he played Perry White in the Superman movies. That's where I knew him from. He was also a director of such shows as MASH, Sledgehammer, one of my personal favourites, Cagney and Lacey, Quincy, The Rockford Files. He was in the Navy during the war and remained in the Navy Thereafter, he reached the rank of captain and he was interred with full honours at the Arlington National Cemetery. Another JFK connection for this episode then? Yes, I didn't know. Yeah, you're quite right there. He, his autobiography was called Please Don't Shoot My Dog and apparently that was for his Oscar winning perform or his Oscar nominated performance in Skippy as a nine year old. There was a scene where he had to cry. Okay. And he wasn't crying. <laughs> so so the director to told him, him, yes, told somebody that he was going to go and shoot his dog, which made him uh, bring on real tears. Ah, uh, that's fantastic direction, but a bit cruel. Yeah, you wouldn't do it. I don't think you, I don't think you could do that these days. Who knows? No dogs were threatened in the production of this podcast. That's true. We move out to the garden where this promo is about to be shot. We hear Nelson himself whistling this old man and I think this is the only time where the killer hums or whistles the, the tune. He's maybe caught an earworm from mm-hmm. Colombo. But I think this reflects, as we've been saying, he is he has the, the upper hand or he certainly feels he has the upper hand in this, this sparring, this dueling with Colombo and by copying his theme tune it sort of hammers that home. Maybe, that's an interesting observation. But Colombo still has an issue. Where did the killer make the call from? So he timed the route from the beach house and there was no public phone around between the time of the death, according to Harry's watch, and when the call was placed. And Nelson provides what he thinks is an answer, which is that Harry set his watch for five minutes fast and therefore the killer could have arrived at the nearest gas station to make the call. But the gas station was shut. Yeah, he plays his trump card here. Colombo says no, it wasn't it wasn't open. He's making a critical error here again trying to explain things, but if this was a mafia operation, there's no way to be certain it was the killer who made the call. Mm-hmm. 
could easily have been someone else who was told at this time, call. Mm-hmm. I agree. But Nelson looks finally stumped, and Columbo enjoys this little moment. I think Columbo can see the fact that Hayward's playing the game. Mm-hmm. There's something to hide, so there's something worth poking at and trying to extract. Sure. Nelson walks away, but is clearly rattled by this ex- this latest exchange. Yeah, he's, he's lost that upper hand that he was enjoying moments earlier. Yeah, and he turns and he tries to provide a, another explanation to this. The killer perhaps called from the beach house. Yeah, he, he's obviously thinking on his feet mm-hmm. here, but it's... Grasping at straws, isn't he? Yeah, it's not a good strategy. Columbo dismisses this. The phone records disprove this. This is a strange one. Yeah, he says if it was calling from the beach house, it would have been a toll call. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't a toll call. So why would it not have been a toll call from the garage? I don't know how these phone systems work back then. It's an odd Unless he's right on this boundary between city and rural. Mm. There is another, another explanation by Nelson thrown in here. He half-heartedly asks if the... The, the, the phone in the garage was outside, but Colombo confirms that it was inside, so inaccessible. Sure. Or unaccessible. Colombo moves on to speaking to Mrs Hayward, who's, yes. who he called Miss Hayward throughout this entire episode. Weird that, isn't it? Yeah. I picked up on that myself, not I sure. I don't know if he just pronounces the two words identically, hmm. or, or what it is, maybe listen out for that in the future. He yeah. certainly refers to her, it sounds like Miss, Miss Hayward. Mm-hmm. She confirms that the clothes which Columbo has brought in his box Harry's clothes I hate this bit mm, that they were definitely Harry's type of clothes they were were functional, they were sturdy they they weren't necessarily fashionable you got a lot of wear out of them that was their primary feature Mm -hmm. and she says that was definitely Harry's character and personality and then Columbo explains that this perplexes him because the watch that was on his wrist was um, a fashion watch. It was daintier. It wasn't fragile. fragile. It wasn't rugged. It wasn't a durable watch. Yeah. And then he says he went to a shop who said that someone who likes durable things would have bought this watch. And it's the exact watch that had it. There's only one durable watch. No, I don't think she said she confirmed that was his. I think she no, said no, that I'm was his saying, type of watch. It, it, the one that Columbo pulled out was the same one that oh, Harry, was it? Yeah, it was taken off Harry earlier okay. Um, yeah, this again was mm, a bit weak because watches are the type of thing that you get given as a, a gift quite often. Perhaps, or maybe you just like that particular yeah. watch. It's not maybe just because you like functional shoes which wear out. I mean, your watch doesn't wear out. He wasn't a he wasn't working down a mine or, yeah. or a manual job. He's probably capable of not breaking a watch. It's a strange one, and even then, people who like a certain type of thing sometimes go away from that. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's set in stone that he would only have bought a functional watch. No. While we're talking about Harry, he was played by Ken Swafford, born in 1933. He was in Thelma and Louise, Annie, 11 episodes of Murder, She Wrote. He played Quentin Morlock in Fame, the TV show. He was unfortunately, or fortunately, jailed for 28 months for a Drink driving felony. Okay. Uh, I think that was the 90s or late 80s. Felony means it was in a fairly serious yeah. incident. To a father and son, I believe, were very seriously injured. The judge, actually, I think at the time, said that other than that, that incident, he could have been a contender for Man of the Year. It was not uh, his character, or not within his nature. This is the first time he'd been involved in anything out with the law. So There you go. Colombo then tells uh, Mrs. Hayward that he's going to ask her a disturbing question, but he does it off camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get to see Hayward's response or his reaction to it. He's fluffing his lines and he's, he's mm-hmm. losing concentration and the director's not happy. So he then goes to speak to his wife who tells him that what Colombo asked was whether Hayward left the room between 9.15 and 9.30. And this cements the fact that Colombo thinks it was Hayward who made the call. Mm-hmm. And as with Linda... Nelson tries to reassure, uh, reassure her. Well, she gets quite hysterical. Mm-hmm. She's very upset about this, and he tries to settle her down, and then nips off to prepare a threatening letter to himself. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's a real sort of old school cliche here. Yeah, and he's a tell sweet, and he's putting together a, a a threat using the cuttings from a newspaper. Although the cuttings themselves don't look like they've come from a newspaper because they've got large areas of white around the border. 
<laughs> on, on each piece of paper. It's almost like it's a prop. <laughs> we go back to the, the campaign office headquarters. I think it's now election day. It is. So the people are all very excited and the adrenaline's pumping. Yep, Nelson is in his office and he removes the gun and silencer from uh, a safe. He puts it in an overcoat. Linda enters the office and Nelson shows her the threat, but she's telling him to drop out of the election. Now, did I miss the point where he shows this to the police? Because I don't remember him doing that. He doesn't show it to the That's the whole point of this scene. She is worried for Nelson but Nelson says he can't show it to the police. He says they already suspect him of creating th- this threat himself in order to gain uh, sympathy. Yeah. And he says that he can't go with it to the police. He wishes someone else could say they found it and it wasn't yeah. him. And she falls for this manipulation, doesn't she? And she says that she will tell the police that she found it that morning. Yeah, but I don't remember that happening, does she? Do we just assume that it was Oh done? yeah, we don't we don't see that happening. Yeah. yeah we, we have to assume that. We go back to the hotel. Nelson goes to his suite and Colombo is in a nearby press room. He's having a nap. He's got a newspaper <laughs> over his face. Yeah, uh, Hayward's watching the early returns coming in on television yes. from the precinct. Colombo tells a sergeant to let him know if Nelson is ever alone in the room. So the sergeant is in Nelson's room with him. Yeah. I when, thought this sergeant looked familiar. Um, mm. Turns out he was in the greenhouse jungle. I was into it. Yeah. Uh, was that Robert Cairns? Robert Cairns? I can't remember his name. Maybe. But maybe. If not. we look into that, that was who he was. Okay. Linda arrives with the briefcase, and that is searched before she enters. Obviously, finding nothing. Yeah. Then Nelson goes into the bedroom within the suite on his own to make private calls. Mm-hmm. And Columbo gets informed of yes. this. He retrieves the gun from his overcoat. And as you say, the sergeant calls Columbo and tells him about Nelson going into the room. And Columbo doesn't think it's you know hugely urgent at this point. He doesn't jump into action, does he? Well, no, what he does is he's watching the phone to mm, see if the we, line lights yeah, up. We find that out, yeah. So with the silencer on, Nelson shoots through the balcony from outside. Yep. Uh, through the balcony door uh, and into the wall beside his desk and chair. Yep, and then he covers up those bullet holes and hides the gun back Mm -hmm. in the briefcase. Mm -hmm. He leaves the bedroom and he asks Linda to return the briefcase to his safe in the office. So he's disposed of the murder weapon. The weapon's no longer on the scene. That's it. And as she leaves, we see the wife, Vicky, arrive. Yeah, and she has serious shade to throw at Linda at this point. Yeah, I think she makes it clear that she knows about Linda and Nelson. How that happened, we don't know. Maybe mm. Columbo mm-hmm. hinted at it. I think perhaps that was the... Part of the shocking news. Mm-hmm. But then she didn't bring it up when they had the conversation No, after that. It's an odd one. They leave to vote, and Columbo stays behind, certainly, initially. Yeah, he's, he looks a bit pensive at this point, mm-hmm. so he's clearly... Thinking things over. We're back to the hotel suite after the voting has been has been done. Yeah, we're up for ready for a big denouement. Mm-hmm. Now. The campaigners are having a party and they're waiting for all the results to come through. And Nelson enters the bedroom. And what does he do here, Ian? He puts his plan into action. He sets off a firecracker just outside his is it patio door, his mm-hmm. window of some kind on the balcony, and People are shocked. And they all run through, don't they? Oh, they're all anxious. They must have thought he's been killed. Yeah. And the sergeant says, exclaims, that the culprit must have been a human fly because he'd previously checked out for security purposes the the situation and no one could have, should have been able to yeah. fire a shot through there. Yeah, and Nelson's very agitated. Yeah, it's an, a big overreaction he, he has here. And he insists that they all... Uh, or, or the sergeant searches him and the apartment if he thinks that he yeah. pl- made, made this shot himself. It's a, I think a strange he's, approach. He's playing up to the falsely accused mm-hmm. um, role that he's yeah. been given, essentially, at this point. Don't you, sorry, on you go. Colombo shows up. Yeah. Just before that, don't you think it's strange that they, that he insists that they search the uh, apartment? Would they not have found the remains of the firecracker? Well, you would think so. Unless yeah. maybe it burns itself all the way out. I don't know. Yeah. I've never used a firecracker. No, neither have I. 
fireworks we have here. We don't do we have firecrackers here? I'm not aware of. But I mean, we used to get those things that you threw in the ground that popped. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember what they were called, but mm. snappers or something like that. Yeah. But I don't remember firecrackers really. Columbo pushes through, and what does he? What does he say? He's saying not to bother about surrounding the building. The killer is, or the the shooter is in the room, mm-hmm. and everyone gets panicked. And Nelson says not to worry. Columbo's talking about him. Yeah. We have a, a clip here. Yeah. Lieutenant, somebody just took a shot at Mr. Haywood. Yeah, I heard. Now, I told Rojas to forget about surrounding the building because the guy that fired that shot is still in this room. What? What's he talking about? It's all right, it's all right, everybody. Huh? He means me. You? Isn't that right? Yes, sir. It's just as I figured. That's exactly what I thought you'd say. I fired the shot, is that it? Lieutenant Colombo, was there a gun in this room? I wouldn't say so, sir, no. I mean, would you concede there's no gun in the room? Yes, sir. All right. Let me show you something. Is this a bullet hole in the glass? Yes, sir. Would you say it was fired at an angle? Calculated to hit a victim in the head here, seated at the phone in this chair? Yes, sir. And would you say that having failed to hit the intended victim, the trajectory indicates that this hole in the wall was caused by the spent bullet? Yes, sir. Would you further concede that if this bullet proves to be from the same gun that killed Harry Stone, that the same hand fired both shots? Yes, sir. Then all that remains for you is to dig the bullet out of the wall and take it to ballistics for a comparison. No, sir. So, after that, Nelson tells Columbo all he needs to do is to remove the bullet from the wall, match that up with the bullet that killed... Uh, Harry. Yeah, it's very familiar because the end of uh, Greenhouse Jungle mm-hmm. went almost exactly the same way. Yeah. Columbo's tested a bullet, matched it to the gun, matched mm. a previous crime yep. or a previous incident, and he has all the evidence he's ever going to need to yep. to put the killer away. But Columbo says that he doesn't need to take the bullet from. No, he's way ahead. Why? Because he dug it out while Hayward was away voting. Mm-hmm. He came and investigated, he found the bullet holes, firstly in the window, then in the wall. He extracted the bullet, had it tested, paired it with the one that killed Harry, and... They're very efficient, aren't they? Oh, they're very efficient. It's not taking very long at all. No. Top-class ballistics department in LA. And essentially, Hayward is banged to rights. There's there's not anything he can do now. And the the, the episode ends. Well, we, we missed one more point. Okay. Colombo points out why he was suspicious. Hayward, had, we, we mentioned it briefly earlier, Hayward had gone to make these private calls but all the phones are on a switchboard, essentially. Mm-hmm. There would have been a line that lit up in the press room mm-hmm. when Hayward made those calls, and it never happened. And he can't understand what a guy might be doing in the bedroom on his own. Having a shower, surely? Perhaps he's having a nap. We don't know if there was a shower. But he told folk he was making calls. Yeah, but he might not want to say, I'm going for a nap. Because yeah, and he came out moments later. So. Oh, that's true, okay. I thought that was a great ending, one of the better ones yeah. that we've had in the show so far. A uh, really nice finish. I think this is one killer who's banged to rights. Sure. Yeah, very enjoyable episode. As I said at the start, um, the only thing that doesn't make it one of the top tier episodes is the padding, which made it the sort of 96 minute length. Rarely does it benefit for the extended time. Uh, and it could have been an A+. plus. Nonetheless, love this episode. Great Definitely. performances, great scene, the right balance, I think, of uh, humour. Uh, decent clues... Yeah, you got a good method from Colombo in this episode. I thought you could see him following his investigation. It wasn't there weren't big leaps no. in knowledge that we weren't aware of. Mm-hmm. Any favourite scene from the episode? I think my favourite was obviously we've talked in the past about how the key points of the best episodes are the relationship between Colombo and the killer normally. Mm-hmm. And I thought again in this episode the relationship between Nelson Hayward and Colombo was the the driving force and the the best part of the episode. So for me, the the best scene, just ahead of the finish, which was brilliant, was the scene with Columbo in the diagram of the mm. cars, shining light in the garage, Nelson having theories and then stonewalling, and then theories and mm. then stonewalling, and then all the just one more things. I, I really enjoyed the sort of tete-a-tete there. I thought that was a really nice part of the yeah. episode. Do you find that you are seeing a development in the Columbo character now? You're... Well, you know, three and a half seasons into it now. 
No, two and a half seasons into two, it. That's the third season. We're yeah, on. we've not done three and a half, though. You're right. We're two and a half. <laughs> Math is not my strong no, suit. But we are still to see things like the Just One More Thing hasn't developed yet. The Look, the phrase hasn't. The, yeah, the action, the action has. Is, it, it's more prominent this year. Certainly mm-hmm. it wasn't in season two much at all. Mm-hmm. It's more prominent in season three, but we've, we've not got the, the phrase, the catchphrase. Mm-hmm. The thing with the dog isn't really a thing at this point. No. So... We'll see if that comes back. Mm-hmm. The car is prominent. I understand you've talked in the past about that becoming a trope. We're seeing that, and again, we saw it in this episode, although you felt unnecessarily. Mm. But it's it's there. I suppose if they've been told by the network this is going to be a 98-minute episode, they need to find a way to make that work. Yeah. Before we wrap this week's episode up, in a couple of things probably worth uh, noting, mentioning. Okay. Just like to really say thanks again to everyone for their interaction and engagement on. It's brilliant reading the comments and the site yeah. every week. It's exciting to see the mm-hmm. folk getting excited about the episodes yeah. and getting involved with one another and having mm-hmm. conversations. We do need to emphasise if you can give us a rating or a review on iTunes, it's going to help more and more people see the episodes and come and join those conversations. Mm-hmm. So that would be ideal if you could help us with that, please. I think we have to give a special mention. Normally we don't pick people out to, uh, and spotlight them, but. Largo's contribution uh, on the NAO port in a, a storm uh, episode. Clearly an important episode for Largo. Yeah, we, we love all the comments. Um, Largo is, was from the heart, so yeah, worth worth noting, I think. Also worth noting if you've got the time to go back to episode one on the website, we've got a, a little spot of music from one of our um, regular commenters. It's worth having a wee listen to. He's got an idea of what a theme for Columbo would have sounded like if there were a theme tune. Fantastic. Really worth going back to Murder by the Book on uh, columbopodcast.com mm. checking out the comments mm. there. Also like to give a little uh, mention to the folk who are involved in Columbo TV. Yes, coming up soon with an episode we've covered recently, I mm. believe. So, Ian, can you explain the concept for people who are not aware of it? Yeah, it's a pre-arranged spot where people watch an episode of Columbo together, essentially. Not while it's being broadcast, but by DVD, Netflix or whatever and join in a conversation in progress Mm -hmm. on Twitter. I think uh, Mr Hinton is Mm -hmm. strongly involved in this. He does a great job. I can't participate because normally it's an episode I've not seen and there's going to be spoilers. And even if it's an episode I have seen, I'm concerned that folk might spoil things that are coming up. Mm -hmm. So I I don't participate myself. But we encourage everybody who's a fan of Columbo to do that. Just keep an eye on the hashtag ColomboTV on Twitter and you will see when the next one's coming yeah. up and be able to get involved. Go on, get involved. We need more people in the Colombo community getting together and being passionate about Colombo. Yeah, I guess. I, I'm not a member of the Colombo community yet, I don't think. I'm ah, still, of course you are. <laughs> I'm still learning. You're one of a, a select band of people who are... Who've watched two and a half seasons. <laughs> who have a Colombo podcast. Well, that's true. Next week, Ian, we have double exposure. We've got a familiar face returning again. Double exposure sounds like a photography-related episode. You We've had so? a dark room already in mm. short fuse. Okay. That'll be interesting if it's well, something to do with that. We'll find out if you're right or not. Yeah. Some production information. Okay. 4th of November 1973 was the original air date. I think I touched on that at the, you the did. top of the show. 93 minutes in length, as we have discussed. Boris Segal, director. You mentioned We've him had already. had him previously. He's the one that died in the horrific helicopter accident. Yes. I... Turned the wrong way coming off a helicopter. <sighs> Nasty. Yeah. Greenhouse Jungle was his previous uh, directorial role in Colombo. Yep. Larry Cohen, the story writer. Three episodes, including last week's Any Old Portrait of Storm. So, two top notch episodes on the bounce. Would not argue with that. No. Mike Lally, a regular. Familiar face. Yeah. He was an uncredited campaigner. Okay. In the office. I think that's us. Have I missed anyone? I don't think so. Okay, so we can turn our focus to double exposure. We can. And we'll join everyone again next week. See you. Cheerio. You have been listening to the Colombo Podcast from Herd Yet Media.